the art of self-reliance is forging your own path, but the path is difficult. Made easier by learning from those who have succeeded in directing their own lives on their own terms. With their help and inspiration, your path to self-reliance moves from dream to reality. And now, here's your host, Dr. Rodney King. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Art of Self-Reliance show. In this episode, I speak to leadership expert, Eric Martin. Eric is a speaker, writer, and teacher on the themes of leadership, change, and the evolution of humanity's relationship to our home planet. He has been published in Fast Company, Stanford Social Innovation Review, and Environmental Leader. In addition, he is the author of Your Leadership Moment, where he explores key concepts of adaptive leadership, how to start perfectly solving the wrong problems, and start creatively solving the right problems, and how to make real positive change. In this episode, we discuss how to discover and leverage your own leadership moments, how to have a healthier, more realistic relationship with people in authority, and finally, letting go of hospicing or old behaviors and mindsets that are no longer fit for purpose so that you can create something truly new. The art of self-reliance calls you to adventure, to develop your self-protection skills, to learn how to survive no matter where you find yourself, and to thrive amongst life's chaos. Eric, here's my first question for you. When you hear the words self-reliance, what does that mean to you? Yeah, um, you know, I think for me, self-reliance, it comes down to a few simple things. One is having a sense of where am I going in life? And that sense of kind of direction, purpose, whatever you want to call it, that coming from someplace bigger than myself. So if I'm clear about that, um, it's easier to navigate, you know, situations that require me to, um, you know, to rely on something other than uh, others. And the other part, I think, is a sense of safety, right? So if my sense of safety is um, not something that comes from within me to some extent. It's hard to be self-reliant. And then lastly, just what am I here to do? You know, what's my role? What's my, what's my work? All these different choices we make day to day. So I think this idea of this, you know, safety, um, clarity about my role, why I'm here, coming from something bigger than myself is a big part of this. And, and ironically, um, you know, another part of this is really renegotiating my reliance on authority you know, on people who we call leaders. And I, I can say more about that later on, but we actually collude, I think, with these people in authority, um, seeking something from them they can't provide. And uh, so that's, I think, a big part of this equation of how do you develop self-reliance? Mm, absolutely. So now I'm with you. I mean, so if I understand kind of where, where your experience comes from, I mean, really, you looking at yourself, how would you define what you do? I mean, definitely a big part of what you do is leadership with leadership training and coaching and consulting, how would you define what you do? You know, very simply put, holding space. It's bringing people together or being with people who are trying to come together and do something, tackle something that they've never done before. So, you know, the, the examples are everywhere, you know, from climate change to the pandemic, the situations that we've never been in before. And we look to people in authority or people with power and look for answers from them. So I'm in those spaces, um, convening them. And then, yeah, some of the coaching and training that you mentioned as well. It's holding space. It's holding space in the unknown uh, and trying to find a way for people to integrate the unknown you know, that comes with being in a new domain uh, into you know, their lives, uh, not trying to reduce it to rational clarity so we can solve it and check it off, but actually embracing the unknown in a way that you know, opens the door for creativity and growth and, and really you know, people developing a shared reliance as well. Yeah, so no, I appreciate that. I mean, most of my academic studies, except for my undergraduate, which was mainly in psychology, the rest of it was within the sphere of leadership. And I always found it quite fascinating, like when you get asked to write a piece on leadership and you go out and you have a look at what is the consensus, right? Like, how would you define leadership? It's, it's very hard to pin down. And it's, it's nobody really has a clear idea. I mean, everybody has their ideas, of course, but there's no consensus on what leadership actually is. So when you're talking about leadership, what are you talking about? What is your perspective? Where are you coming from? It's fascinating, right, Rodney? I mean, you look at the, you start reading one book and this book, and there's, by my count, 170 different theories or models of leadership out there right now. 
And I've tried to read every single one, you know, because I'm fascinated by this question of leadership. It, it really does, in some ways, encode a lot of deep values and aspirations that we have for ourselves and for the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's roughly two schools of thought around leadership. I'll give you mine in a second. It'll probably be apparent from what I say. Uh, so the one school of thought is what's known as the great man, you know, the great person theory of leadership. I've heard you talk about this in prior and prior podcasts. And it's, um, you know, this idea that it's about charisma and vision and all these kind of traits that we would talk about as leadership. And that, that started with Thomas Carlyle, right? I mean, that's kind of where it started. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I got perpetuated. So the work that I do, and I'll say more maybe later on around this notion of adaptive leadership, which I think you're familiar with, is um, it comes out of the Kennedy School, Kennedy School up at Harvard. And there's this uh, not so well-known uh, battle that took place within the Kennedy School between uh, David Gergen, you may have seen him on CNN. He's kind of their CNN political analyst and a guy named Ron Heifetz. And it was kind of this battle between the great person theory of leadership. Gergen had worked with presidents and others. And, uh, and then Heifetz, who espoused this idea that leadership is a behavior. And, um, and that's the other school of leadership, which is the one that I, that I really, you know, I think makes a lot of sense to me from my own lived experience. So again, easy thing to say, what does that really mean? We can unpack, but I think that's kind of the school of thought that I'm in. And it's a very specific kind of behavior in that it's not dependent upon authority, your own or anybody else's. And so that kind of gets us into a really interesting ter- terrain of how do you create consequential change when you don't have the power or authority to do so? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a really good point. I guess my notion of leadership as well is like just changed over time. And I think for like many people, I've become quite despondent about leadership in general, or at least what has been set up to be leaders, right? Because our typical experience of them is that they're not very um, good at what they do. They're, they're not excellent leaders. They fall short all the time. So the question really is, is like, how do you become that leader that doesn't fall into that category where you can actually make change where change is, is needed. One of the things that you talk about is this idea of edge walkers. Maybe you can kind of explore that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Because, you know, just to paraphrase what that is, right? I mean, what you're suggesting there with people that are edge walkers are people who are challenging the status quo while trying to stay alive within it, right? And it's really difficult when potentially the status quo, when we talk about leadership, isn't necessarily, at least from my perspective, it's not really leadership in a place to help people become better or at least transform their lives, it seems oftentimes to be very self-fulfilling, narcissistic, and I'm actually just there for myself and my buddies, right? That's my experience from South Africa because that's where I originally came, right? And not really for the real reason I'm there, which is really to help help people, help my community. Yeah. Um, yeah, a story about... Uh, leadership in South Africa, which I'd love to bounce off you at some point as I respond to this really wonderful question, you know, what is, what is leadership? How do you become the kind of leader um, or don't become the kind of leader that you don't want to become having experienced bad leadership? Yeah. I think the first thing, Rodney, and this is really critical is to be more precise with our language. Um, You know, and you hear it all the time, right? You read, if you read the newspaper or just listen to your own lamenting, we'll say something along the lines of, gosh, we're not getting any leadership from leadership. You know, the people who, you know, the, the leaders aren't leading. So what does that really mean? And if you kind of parse out the language, I think what we really mean is that we're not getting any leadership from people in authority. And I'll, I'll say more about what I mean by that. Um, this idea of authority, of course, is um, all in the air now. People are talking about authoritarianism. Regardless of what side of the political spectrum you might be on, people are worried about authoritarianism. One way to think about authority uh, and this could be whether you're a mother or a father or a CEO or executive director, or, is that there's four basic functions of authority, four basic services, kind of a Rousseauian contract, if you want to think of it that way, social contract. And the first is to provide a sense of direction. You know, we want people in charge to know where they're going, be it a vision statement or a North Star strategic plan, whatever, you know, different forms that that takes. The second thing is that we want the people in charge uh, to tell us what our role is. You know, what's your job description? That's why we have things like org charts and roles and responsibilities, job descriptions, and also, you know, the intangible things like, you know, what's your role? How do you behave when someone uh, comes at you in a way that's conflictual? So the norms, the behaviors is something we look for people in charge to give us a sense of what to do, what's accepted around here. The third is protection. Uh, we want people in charge to keep us safe. It could be you know, keeping my resources, what they, you know, what they should be, budget, it could be physical protection, but we want people uh, in authority to have that kind of 
um, influence. And lastly, as you said a moment ago, we want them to know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> There's a sense of, you know, we want them to be experts or at least have some sense of it. And, and um, if you look at those four things, direction, order, protection, and expertise, they spell out a really interesting acronym, which is DOPE. I don't know about in your cultural context, but over here in, in the States, that means something particular. And it's very addictive, right? I mean, it, the idea is that if you could say to people, here's where we're going, here's your role, you'll be safe, and we know what we're doing, that's like dope, right? It feels great. It's addictive, actually, too. And there's nothing wrong with that if you can provide those answers. The problem, of course, being you know, in situations that require self-reliance that we've never been in before, what I call adaptive situations, adaptive problems, you can't provide those things. And so what happens is people get disappointed in you right? Well, I expect this of you. Let's get a new leader. So the irony of all this, Rodney, is that these people who are in authority, you know, who have to provide direction, order, protect, and expertise, and who we collude in expecting that from them, they don't exercise leadership because they can't many times. It's risky to challenge the status quo, to say to people, I don't know where we're going. I'm not sure if you're going to be safe, but come with me anyway. I mean, imagine trying to pull that off and get away with that in a meeting or as a head of an organization. So there's this really corrupt bargain between people who we call leaders who actually aren't and us. And so what I want to do is kind of just begin to be more precise and say, okay, you have authority. It comes with these expectations and constraints of providing dope. Um, what would it look like now to disappoint people? And that's one of my, my favorite definitions of leadership at the moment is disappointing your own people at a tolerable pace. Because when you begin to say to people, we don't know, but let's figure it out, right? And join me. Uh, can't guarantee we'll be safe, but I'm going to do the best I can. People will find that disappointing. But if you do it at a tolerable pace, you can begin to build people's capacity, leadership capacity, adaptive capacity, and reliance, self-resilience to navigate the edge, right? Navigate the edge of what we know how to do. Navigate that dangerous boundary between the status quo and creating something truly new. And those, those are the people that I think of as edge walkers. So yeah, I'd say, I can say more about that, but that's kind of the basic way I think about leadership. And for me, that's really empowering because it means you don't have to be a person with uh, you know authority and power and a title. In fact, if you have it, you probably are not going to exercise leadership as we see time and time again. No, that's very, that's very interesting. So just as you were saying that, I was thinking you got this one side of it where leaders do not want to accept when they've made mistakes or when they don't know. And I guess on the other side, is it not that we as a society, especially in the Western world, have become so over-reliant on other people making decisions for us that when we don't get the decision made that we are expecting, that's where the trouble comes in, right? And so there seems to also be, not just from the leadership side, this kind of problem, but there's also from the other side, the people that are looking to those leaders and they're not getting what they want. But at a time, you know, when you look at people, it's like they want those particular leaders to make all the decisions and to decide everything. It's almost like we've, we've kind of just taken a step back, lost our self-reliance, our personal sovereignty. And instead of, you know, finding a way for ourselves or creating our own leadership moments, we keep putting it over to these people that we already know don't have the answers, don't want to say that they don't have the answers and don't necessarily want to look for a different way to achieve an outcome. I think that's exactly right. We, we, one of the ways we give away power is, is by not recognizing we have it in the first place. You know, we, we just look to people because we're trying to do so, right? I mean, the way it should work is that you know, people in authority should actually you know, provide those services. And if we're in a community, if we're in an organization, if we're in a world, where the people who have experience and wisdom uh, know how to use it well, right? And know how to acknowledge what they don't know. Uh, then it'd be fine to follow these people, you know, in authority. But again, the collusion is when we call them leaders. Um, and then we, as you said, we just really uh, give away our own sense of agency and empowerment and sovereignty. And, and uh, it's, um, it's kind of baked into the system, right? If you think about, you know, organizational life, you, I think you do coaching as well, right, Rodney? And so people... I mean, how well is um, and how much is leadership expected in organizations? You know, that, that kind of leadership we're talking about, um, particularly if it's deeper in the organization, it's, it's not really well, it, even though people say they want leadership, they don't really want leadership. What they want is people who have power and authority who agree with them, who will put the resources to do what they think should happen. And then, again, that's fine if that's what you want, but that has nothing to do with changing anything. It has to do with the status quo perpetu perpetuation. So yeah, I think you're exactly right. And so part of my work and, and the mission behind my work is to what I call democratize leadership, uh, which is, it's there's kind of two ideas there. One is the idea 
of obviously providing access to these ways of thinking about leadership, be it trainings or what have you. Uh, because I grew up in the city of Detroit, you know, which some of your listeners may know was uh, uh, a tough city to grow up in, particularly in the 70s and 80s, where it was the height of the decline. And every day I saw my father, who was a firefighter, uh, I used to watch him be in the second story of my house in my bedroom, and he would set out at six in the morning to go to the firehouse. I'm told one of the one of the best firefighters in the city that I grew up in of Detroit, even now when I go back, the old timers say, oh, yeah, I knew your dad. Um, so I was really proud, you know, and it was a tough city, uh, a lot of fires. We had like 300 fires um, over the weekend in the Halloween, Halloween season. Um, and he went out every day. I would watch from the second floor bedroom window as he went out to work and would disappear for 24 hours and come back. And, uh, and meanwhile, as he's driving away on his, in his little van, I'm looking at the fires on the horizon, just the city burning, burning every day saying, gosh, you know, what, what are we doing here? And as a child, of course, you don't have that language. You don't understand systems and racism and structural racism and all that was kind of going into the city's decline. But at a, at a gut level, I knew that just putting out the fires every day was not going to do it. So here it was ironic, right? He's a leader. He's at the top of his game as an expert delivering all those services of authority to the people who depend on him. And yet the game wasn't changing, you know, the, the same problems. So I think that was a really, for me, a, a very, um, it, it was sobering on the one hand, because I saw the city and friends and people, you know, just kind of fall into despair and drugs and things of this sort. But on the other hand, you know, that kind of fire of injustice that I experienced and saw is really driven my work. And so a lot of the notion of democratizing leadership that I'm speaking about is putting those kind of tools to create meaningful change into the hands of the people who, who actually are already doing it. You know, they're not leaders, you may not see them. The other skill set of democracy though, as I think about it, is the skill set of holding conflict and tension. Conflict and tension in a life-giving, life-affirming, creative way. Because when you start to challenge the status quo, entrench interests and, you know, and kind of invite people into a creative process, you're gonna have all that stuff that happens when people go through change and growth. And so holding that, that, that space for people, as I said earlier on, is a really critical leadership skill set. And gosh, if we had more of that in our government and politics, and we could do amazing things in this country and elsewhere. So I think that's a really core set skill set of democracy itself. Sure, that's important. You know, as you were saying that, I was just going to get your take on this because this I find this fascinating. And I think a lot of people potentially listening to this may not know this. I mean, to be honest, I didn't know this until I, you know, went down the rabbit hole, started doing my research and du during my graduate training and, and so on. But one of the things that I came across, which I thought was very interesting to me, is that we've kind of just taken for granted that there was always this kind of distinction between the followers and the leaders. There's always been leaders and there's always been followers, right? And that's how it's always been since the dawn of mankind. But actually, that's not correct. And so if you go back and you look at the vast majority of time that we were as a species on this planet, we spent that time as hunter gatherers. I mean, this modern interpretation of what we call the world as we know it now is like, you know, it's like a tip of a, of a pin, you know, it's the, it's the shortest period in time since we, since we know that we've been on this planet. Right. So for all the other 95% of the time that we've been here, we were hunter gatherers. And if you look across the board and you look at the research that's been done in this area, it is very evident that leadership was very different in hunter-gatherer societies. In actual fact, there were no leaders. And if anybody was given a leadership position, they were given it only for a momentary time based on whatever was needed at that time. So I'm assuming, of course, there would be if you had specific skill sets that were needed, let's say you were much better or you were the best hunter that we had and we were short of food, we would put you in a role of leadership and we would follow you until that goal was achieved. Then leadership hands would change. One of the interesting things about this study as well and, and the research in this is that if somebody wanted to hold on to the power, if they wanted to stay as a leader, they were chastised for it. They were given a hard time. They were belittled. They were never encouraged to stay in a leadership role. So I think that's fascinating because like I said, just to go back to the beginning, is that there is this perception that there has always been leaders, there has always been followers, but in actual fact, that isn't the case. Yeah, it's fascinating, Rodney. Yeah, I mean, our, the notion that we have of leadership in kind of modern, kind of the dominant cultures uh, is we, we've kind of backward projected that on the past and said, well, they must have had what we have, or if they didn't, they must have been ignorant or, you know, barbaric. Uh, but it's exactly as you say. And, and, and again, this is where that, that 
slight, subtle, but important distinction between leadership and authority is useful. So if you think about, you know, what these people whom we were calling leaders were expected to do in hunter and gatherer um, communities, you know, being the expert hunter, uh, having a specific project to deliver on, these are actually authority functions, <laughs> right? Um, you know, protecting the, the tribe, whatever it might have been. Uh, these are authority functions and absolutely essential. You can't have a functioning social unit, uh, be it an organization or a tribe, without authority. Um, really important. But it's not leadership. It's not leadership. Leadership would be taking people into the unknown, right? It might be engaging perhaps with a uh, situation that we've not come across before. And that was the responsibility of the entire tribe or community, right? Yeah. So in some respect, leadership was always there, but we don't call that leadership because our view of leadership is this great person theory, right? Um, and it's really fascinating for me. It, I've been really trying to figure out through my work over many decades now from a systems change point of view, how, what does it take to create real change? And what are the practices for that? And not surprisingly, I've found myself drawn toward many indigenous customs, rituals, and practices. For example, the idea of council, you know, as a, as a meeting, you think it was a meeting format where everyone has equal space to share what's on their mind. We're not problem solving necessarily. We're not trying to convince necessarily. We're not listening to one leader speak necessarily. We're actually trying to do some shared sense-making about a situation for which we don't have a, an easy answer or capacities or skills to respond to. And through that shared sense-making arises, emerges action that might look spontaneous from the outside, that might seem generative from the outside, but actually is informed by this collective sense-making, not as in let's create a Gantt chart and project plan, but a real, you know, kind of a systemic understanding of what is up. And so, that, and that's a very simple format to institute this council format, just, you know, a talking circle kind of thing. But to hold that space, particularly when it gets really difficult, is a leadership skill set. Why don't we do more of that? You know, and, and people are increasingly bringing these kind of practices into kind of mainstream organizational life, but it's still seen as somewhat of an outlier. And I want to see, bring more of this ancient technology uh, for leadership and um, and coming together back into our day-to-day -day life. I love that. I mean, I love the idea of holding space. So it's kind of interesting for me because where I've had the most success in this sphere hasn't actually been with organizations. So as a, a martial arts teacher, because that's one of the things that I do, I have people that I coach that will come together at retreats and they will be from so many different backgrounds. You know, some people that are just, you know, you know, got an everyday job. It's nothing spectacular all the way through to what we would consider in, in the modern world as something that's important, right? A CEO of a fortune 500 company, but them not knowing that part of each other and being put in an experience where we're on the mat and we're discussing the experience and we basically just in community and we discuss in that experience and it's nobody's trying to lead the conversation. And if that is the case, and if somebody's trying to overtake the entire conversation, my role in that moment, as if we want to call it the, the leader of that discussion is to ensure that that doesn't happen and that other people have the opportunity to hold space for themselves and express what they need to express. So at the end, everybody's viewpoint is valued. And I always find it fascinating how you can achieve that in that environment, but that's almost impossible to do in organizations where you have the stratification between, you know, the top leaders, the management, and then the workers, right? And so, you know, it's very difficult to, to pull that off. I guess you'd probably have a better idea on how that possibly could be achieved in an organizational setting. You know, Ronnie, is one of, one of the great regrets, I guess it's not too late of my life is I've not actually immersed myself in, in the martial arts at all. A little bit of judo and Aikido when I lived in Japan, I was there for five years um, and kind of absorbed some of that culture from friends who were really immersed in judo. Um, but it, it seems to me there's a lot of wisdom in these in these lineages uh, that we can learn learn from. And um, and I, where, I, where my mind goes when I think about the scenario you just painted is this question of um, purpose. You know, why am I here? If I'm here to be a student, am I here to get the black belt? Am I here to, you know, follow some prescribed plan? Maybe some of us. But my guess is that folks who can really engage in that deeper work of coming together and supporting each other on a growth path are, path are there for a, a bigger reason. I'm, I'm just assuming, but it could be self-actualization. It could be uh, personal growth. It could be being part of a tradition and lineage that's bigger than any one person um, or, or many other things. But that connection to a deeper purpose, a deeper reason for being, to me, seems to be one of the key ingredients 
for people being willing to tolerate, you know, being cut off by a facilitator or a leader or a trainer or listening to dissenting point of views. And I think, you know, organizations aren't set up to do that, unfortunately. And this gets us into a conversation potentially around, you know, where do people derive purpose and meaning? It used to be, I think, coming from the tribe, from the community, and for folks who had some kind of religious or faith tradition from that perhaps as well. And as these institutions, and they're more than institutions, but as these practices have gone away, we're still meaning-seeking beings as human beings. So we're going to try to find meaning in places that aren't designed to give it to us. And work, the workplace, you know, 8, 12, 16 hours a day is where we go. It's where we are. And uh, I think that's a lot of the organizational dysfunction that I see that I'm sure you see as well. And these are miserable places <laughs> you know, where people feel it's competitive, it's cutthroat. Even the great nonprofits, I've worked for many of the, you know, the great organizations, Google, even when it was growing, it was still very competitive. And you now that's, I mean, competition is a good thing, but not to the point where it begins to put people into a state of distress because there's two different kinds of uh, stress. There's distress and eustress. Eustress is, uh, EU is the Greek word for growth. Uh, like a, almost like a plant is stressed by the sun, but it turns toward the sun to grow. So we want to have as much use stress as possible, but most organizations are set up uh, for distress. And it's really hard to tolerate that or thrive in that when you're not connected to a higher purpose. So, I, you know, that's kind of my, maybe my projection on martial arts, but I have the sense there's something more that people are tapping into that gives them that courage to engage. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. And so one of the things I was thinking about there as well is that, and I don't know if you've seen this, but there definitely is a shift I think right now amongst people that are going into or looking to engage in, in work in the past, it was like you went, you got a job and you would stay in that job for 30, 40 years, and then you would retire. Now that isn't the case. And I, I get the sense, especially from younger people and where I'm also drawing this from is that my son is 21 this year. So he's, you know, he's in his third year of uh, university. He's kind of getting into what it is to work and I'm listening to him and my younger son is, turning 17. So he's thinking about all these things. And one of the things that I'm noticing amongst the young people is that they don't want to just do work for the sake of work anymore. They actually want work. And it speaks to what you just said. They want work that has meaning and it has meaning beyond just themselves, their self-interest and the organization's self-interest. So more than just making profits, I think the kind of the, the wording around that that I've seen is the wisdom economy, right? Is going from the information economy, which we've been in, into a wisdom economy where people want what they do to make a difference. So for example, they're going to be more inclined to want to work for an organization that is explicit about doing something about climate change versus ones that are basically perpetuating the problem. And so that's interesting to me. I mean, have you noticed that too, that there's that kind of shift yeah. happening? Uh, so, uh, first of all, you must be doing something right with your two boys. If uh, if they're looking for I meaning, so. <laughs> I mean, I, my my young, well, he's my oldest. Uh, he was he's fifteen now, but when he was in kindergarten, I remember he came home from school saying, "Daddy, Daddy, I got to be the leader today. I was carrying the uh, the flag. They you know marched the flag down the street." And I said, "Well, actually, Henry, you're not you're not a leader. <laughs> that's that's authority. But we'll get into that later on. But I think I probably screwed him up. Uh, you know, but but it's a it's a really. I mean, it it is a um." It is happening. And, you know, the wisdom economy, people talk about it as a purpose economy as well. I think there's different ways. Um, I think my concern for, you know, for your kids, for my kids, for this generation is that, again, organizations are not set up to do this. I mean, even an organization that's tackling climate change or any other issue that we might care about. And I'm not saying, you know, all organizations are bad. Clearly they're not. But I, as I look 15, 20 years down the road, I think we're going to see organizations cease to be the predominant vehicle through which people uh, bring their gifts and talents and passions to the world. Um, I think the, um, uh, the the kind of the sharing economy, the Uber, like that, that's the first step out, but it's still very much in that old model. And that's why I think we need a different kind of leadership, a more democratized kind of leadership. Um, so what's it going to look like? I, it's hard to say, but my advice to my own children has been to, um, even with the pandemic, for example, I was really glad they were disrupted in their schooling. So they didn't leave their early, you know, schooling career thinking that that's the only way you can learn. So running outside, you know, jumping on logs, all the stuff they did quite naturally once they were free to me is a great experience. You know, I know a lot of people suffered and there was some, you know, definitely some downside to the academic learning, but as people, they grew. And so my, my encouragement to kids, uh, young and old, and same advice I got actually when I was in high school is, um, is give it time. When you graduate from high school uh, or college, 
take a year off, take five years off, take 10 years off. And it doesn't take a lot to live. You know, you could live on $60 a day in, in many places, which is what I did for a while. Um, so, you know, I think it takes a moment outside of the system before you can re-engage in the system and see what's really worth my attention and what's worth my care, what's calling to my care. Sure. Or you can, or you can have the courage, right, to actually, as you were stating right in the beginning, is to challenge the status quo. So I have that, have that bravery to say, well, why do I need to do it that way? I can find a different way to do it. So again, talking about my eldest son, Egan, he and a few buddies decided, and I mean, we're talking about, you know, young, young guys, right? They, they're, in, they're in their early 20s. And as we were talking about what they wanted to do. And they were like, well, nobody's doing what we want to do because they're, they're in the, you know, kind of music industry. And there's a specific thing that they're doing. And I said, well, why don't you just create it? But no, no, we can't. I mean, why, why can't we? Well, because we nobody. I said, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, it's an idea. Nobody else is doing it. You know that if you went and you worked for other people, you'd have to give up a lot of your freedom and your creative spirit, and you could decide to do it yourself. So long story short, they've done it, and they're doing it. Now, it's not to say that it's easy, but they decided to step outside of the status quo and find a way to make it work for themselves. And I think that's beautiful. And if we could have more people doing that, challenging the status quo and deciding, you know what, actually, then I'll just create, create my own thing. And that's even like, not to keep going back to martial arts, but in my martial arts programs, I have a specific way that I teach and my philosophy. And it's quite different to what most people do out in the modern martial arts world. I'm not about hyper-competitiveness. I don't stand for the kind of meathead attitude. I, I, it's not just a saying for me, I mean it, leave your ego at the door. We challenge play. We don't try to compete with each other. So every person on the mat helps you achieve success. And without that person, you don't get anywhere. So it's not somebody that you just come in and tear apart, right? And often the question is, wow, I love what you're doing, Rodney, and I love this whole idea, but I can't find a place, another martial arts school that does that. So what do you think I should do? I said, well, if it's that important to you and you love what we're doing, start it yourself, even if it's just out of your garage you know, get a, get a group of people together and build it from there. And so that you can then have the environment that you want to be in. And I think that's also important. That's fascinating. And it's, it's a good example of you doing what you're advising your son to do, which is, it bodes well for him. <laughs> you stepped outside the norm, but you've, you're dancing on that edge again. You're, I mean, you're, you call it martial arts, right? You're not calling it something completely different. It is martial arts. And yet the way the pedagogy you're using is quite different from what you, you know, probably were exposed to or what others typically are exposed to. And I think that's a great example, again, of building the leadership capacity of others to do what you're doing. And, and um, it's not about, re re you know, replicating the dinosaur, but it's finding their own path. Um, the, 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 the thing that I think is really interesting about your, that model you just described, which I'd love to hear more about too, is when people, um, when, when they have an, a certain expectation for a certain kind of guidance and structure and they don't get it, how do you, I mean, well, I, I guess, you know, it's a question for me is how, how do you help people uh, begin to see the assumptions, the biases, uh, the expectations they're bringing to the table as a source of learning, right? Because there's a tendency sometimes for people, even in leadership work, to look for the checklist solution. Oh, this is how he did it. This is how she did it. If I just do it this way. And I think part of what I hear you talking about and what I talk about in leadership too is helping people find find their own path right this is about self-reliance as well but not becoming overly reliant on the path that's been laid out before them and that's a delicate balance for people yeah and that's a really good point i mean the way that i typically and i'll just be brief about it but the way that i typically approach this when somebody asks me like you know I, i'm doing i think this applies across the board to be honest this has been my experience in my own life but when somebody says to me well you know I, Hey, Rodney, you teach martial arts. What's the ultimate goal that you're trying to achieve with people? Like, what do you want to see them do? I said, look, you know, first and foremost, obviously I want them to have functional skills. I want them to be able to be in a position that should a situation arise that they can actually protect themselves. With that said, the quintessential characteristic for me there is going to be adaptability. I want them to be adaptable. So the question really is, if we have to reverse engineer that, how do you get to the point where you're going to get somebody to be adaptable? And in my experience, it's quite interesting because I don't think this is how most people would think about it. Well, first of all, there's no way that you can uh, be adaptable unless you have a measure of innovation, right? So you need to innovate because you need to innovate ideas on the fly 
which ultimately means adaptability and then apply it, right? And you can't get to innovation unless you're being creative. So the question is then, right, how do I develop my creativity? Well, where they're going to develop their creativity is actually on the mat when they're training. Now, nobody's going to be creative if there is an ultimate consequence, meaning that if they try something and it doesn't work, they're going to pay the ultimate price. So in this example would be somebody gets seriously injured or they get knocked out. Because if you come into train with me and I say, hey, Eric, listen, man, just, just try anything. You know, it doesn't have to be right or wrong, but just try anything, be creative, see where it leads to, and then we can have a discussion about it. And you try to do that, but I am more skilled and I beat the crap out of you, you know, I knock you out. Next time I say to you, hey, Eric, be creative, man. You're going to be no way in hell. So you don't ever, ever then test what's the potential, what the possibilities are, right? Because you're too afraid of making a mistake. So what does that tell me? That tells me that you have to set up the environment where built within this framework is failure because without failure or the ability to fail. Now, of course, you know, I say this judiciously in the sense that I don't want people to fail if it means failing means the end of their life, but we're talking about a training experience. Yeah, Yeah. they're learning. And so they can afford to do that. I want them to be able to fail, know that they failed, but without it being an ultimate price and ultimate consequence that they can't continue to play the game, right? And so if I can keep recreating that over time, it builds inner confidence, which then will naturally lead to creativity, leads to innovation, which leads to adaptability. Amazing. That's great. I mean, this is this is the work of leadership. As I hear you talking about it, this is how I think about leadership development, or literally. Um, It's giving the work back to people, right? You're giving the work because only they can do their own learning. This is firsthand experience, but you're giving them a structure, an authority structure, Again, talking about safety, expertise, you're giving them an authority structure within which they can be creative, fail and learn and make sense of those learnings, right? Um, so that, this is really important. And the other part, you know, that I think is implicit in here too, you talked about it earlier on, and this gets to one of the key tenets of leadership as I think about it. I talked about leadership and authority before, but it's a distinction between what we call technical problems and adaptive problems. And again, this comes out of the adaptive leadership framework out of Harvard, which I work with. And in, in the book, Your Leadership Moment, which I wrote, really is an extension of that and a deepening of that principle. And this, this idea that there's kind of two kinds of problems, you have technical problems. So learning particular techniques, particular moves uh, in an organizational context, you know, there's plenty of technical problems where there's a clear problem, a clear solution that you can rely on an expert or an authority figure for, right? Most, in fact, 65% of work in organizational life is, is technical. Uh, like a broken arm, right? A broken arm's technical. You have a broken arm, clear problem, clear solution, clear expert. We don't need to debate about it. We don't need to bring people together and talk about our feelings. You just get an expert and solve it. But adaptive problems like the arsons in Detroit, like climate change, uh, like many aspects of the pandemic response, um, like martial arts, right? There's a, a learning that has to happen. And these adaptive problems are not so easy to define up front. And the solution is really with the people, right? So what you're doing is creating a learning space within which people can figure out what they need to figure out uh, with your expertise, with your guidance, but much through their learning and, you know, and failure. The other thing that we find, and I you know, don't know what the parallels are with martial arts, but, uh, and this is really important in, in the work that I, as I see, you know, kind of deep work of change is, uh, is loss, um, not losing a competition, but the idea that in order to learn something, to really integrate something that I've learned, often requires letting go of something that I've become really enamored with. It could be my own ego, my own sense of confidence and pride. It could be you know, loss of resources or other things that take more of an organizational construct. But when people are engaging in adaptive change, you know, that requires iterative learning, failure, stepping into the unknown, um, they're going to need to at least consider giving something up uh, because that giving up is part of the status quo. And, so you've heard this expression, I'm sure that people resist change. It's actually not true, right? People don't resist change per se. You know, like if uh, if you won the lottery, you wouldn't give the ticket back. I don't know anyone's given the ticket back. So you know what? My wife and I, we plan our budget for the year and it's going to create too much change in our life. You can have the money back. So, you know, we don't resist the change per se. What we're resisting is loss. Uh, and so if you can help people identify what it is they're afraid of getting, letting go of, then you can help them take that next step together. And, you know, I don't, again, I don't know about martial arts, but I know just other physical uh, forms of expression, uh, be it dance or, you know, exercise. I've often had to make a choice between becoming healthier and spending more time at the gym 
uh, and giving up or letting go or losing some time somewhere else in my life, it, be it at work or with the family or with the kids. I chose to have that loss at work. That's a tough choice. You know, it's not impossible, but until you see the choice, what happens is you get into this New Year's resolution thing where you wish to be different in a system that likes you exactly as you are, <laughs> the weight that you are, the eating habits that you have, whatever it may be. And so being willing to kind of push back is another form of disappointing people, disrupting the status quo, distributing that loss, you know? Um, so uh, to me, that's a really, if, if I get resistance from a client or in, you know, other kinds of work, my first question isn't how do I convince them about the benefits of change? It's what are they afraid of giving up? And, and really empathizing with that, coming into dialogue around that. And I think really well-honed leadership teams uh, and communities are, are good at identifying what part of their culture, their history, their identity uh, may have served a noble purpose for many years, but needs to go in order for innovation and creativity to have a place to take hold. I think what you said there is very powerful. I think that's like probably one of the more important perspectives that I've heard of late, just on something that I think could be very practical and something that can be applied, right? I guess giving up something, then you have to have the realization that what you're giving it up for is better than what you're losing, right? It's, it has a more value to you. And that's definitely where I could see the role of a leader stepping in to bring that vision to light, right? That's right. Elevating your needs, uh, really, not just meeting your needs, but elevating mm. your needs, elevating what you see as possible. That's exactly right. And, and it's hard. It's hard to articulate and guarantee that what is on the other side of the loss will be better. And this, that brings me back to the earlier point of my sense of, purpose, my sense of meaning in life has to come from something bigger than just myself and bigger than, you know, what my organization says is valuable or bigger than what society says is valuable. There's many different ways that we, we can source that, you know, that, that kind of awareness. But uh, I think that's a big part of leadership as well. It's helping people connect to something bigger. And back on the topic of, you know, the self-reliance, you asked earlier on what comes to mind for me. Uh, the other thing that came to mind was this idea of self um, and maybe not a unique idea, but what is a self? And I've learned from, in fact, from some of your previous guests, uh, Charles Eisenstein being one of them, mm. that this, um, this idea of self is also a bit of a backward projection, you know? Um, and when we come to understand our self uh, as a relationship, for me, that begins to change the whole dialogue around meaning and purpose uh, and self-reliance because if I'm just a self in a world of other, you know, or if I'm just a self having relationships with these other selves, uh, that lends itself more to competition, you know, more to siloed behavior. But if I see myself as relationship, as relationship, you know, it brings a very different awareness to the kind of problems that we face as a community, as organizations, as a world. And so I've been really trying to tap into that a little bit, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's important too. So when I'm hearing you say then, when just thinking about my own experience, so when I did my, my PhD, my focus was actually on mindfulness and I did it from a very different perspective. I looked at mindfulness in action and its role in leadership performance. And I was very interested in how you can embody mindfulness and not just make it a cognitive experience, but actually something that you bring your entire self to, right? So there's that idea of self. And so one of the outcomes that was very powerful was and this is definitely where I saw leaders shifting and gaining something that they never thought possible was what they had to do and what mindfulness allows you to do if you do it the way that I'm describing is you step outside your ego self. So you kind of set that aside, which means that when you go in and you are with the people that you need to be working with, your team, you're not starting off from a place of preconceived or preconditioned um, perspectives, right? You haven't set a narrative in place and you've already decided what the outcome is going to be. So you step in there clear of that. And that's what mindfulness allows you to do, which then makes you far more open to what is arising in the moment. And that's really kind of the definition of mindful communication, my ability to be fully with you without having a narrative, a story running in my head, which most people do, where I'm listening to you, but I'm really trying to preempt or you know, decide what I'm going to say next to either shut you down or to convince you otherwise. And so what ends up happening is we just talk past each other, right? And we never get to this place where we actually have genuine conversation. And I think that's also important is that that idea of what you're speaking about, that community feel where you're in community in leading, you're going to have to set aside your ego self. You're going to have to have practiced that and have that as part of your experience 
in order to achieve the outcome that you're talking about. Yeah, that's a powerful point. And it, it definitely correlates that you probably know the work of Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy at the School of Education at Harvard as well. I mean, some of the foremost adult learning experts, and they talk about stage five of human development being a lot about what you're talking about. For me, in my language, in my work, I think about that as a um, as an expanded sense of self, when my sense of who I am doesn't end with my skin, but it, it includes you. It includes you know, the community includes the world in some ways. And, and acting from that place feels entirely different. It is creative. It is generative. It isn't waiting for my turn to speak. Uh, it's really emergent. And, and that's really exciting too. It, it's for me where real joy comes from. And that expanded sense of self is also another way that I think I've come to understand what love is. So we don't talk about love in leadership very much, but, you know, gosh, <laughs> if we had that expanded sense of self and, you know, and that kind of, you know, uh, c- community, as you said, that comes from that, I do think it would change maybe even overnight our ability to tackle some of these big challenges in our organizations, but also in our world. So yeah, this is, this is the work. I I really feel like, you know, as we think about the next 10, 20, 30 years of leadership development um, it's evolved significantly since the Deming days, then you had the EI work with, you know, and then it, it was all kind of building up, but now I think we're actually entering a whole different domain that almost shouldn't even be called leadership anymore. Uh, (laughs) But I'll I'll call it that as long as I can, because people think they want it. Uh, yeah, no, sure. So how, I mean, how would you just do, cause as we get to near the end of the, the discussion, how would you describe that? What would be, I mean, obviously it might be, you might say, well, actually Rodney, it's kind of a work in progress, right? Cause I have lots of ideas, but I don't have a definitive defined clear way of describing it, but I know where I'm going. I can see the, the writing on the wall. So how would you, how would you describe that? Gosh, yeah, that's a topic for another conversation for sure. I think for, for me in, in three sentences, three sentences <laughs> it's, um, I think it's rediscovering our shared humanity, rediscovering our shared humanity. That's four words, I think. <laughs> no, I like that. I think that's good because that definitely speaks to what we talked about earlier. We were talking about the kind of tribal or at least hunter gatherer notion of what it is to be a leader is that you lead only when you need to, right? When it's, when it's needed to keep the tribe healthy, right? And then knowing when to step out and let somebody else take the reins. So I think that's 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 a really nice way of describing it. If I can give you a quick anecdote to close mm-hmm. out here, Rodney, uh, which I think is on that point and also on the point of self-reliance. Uh, there's a, a gentleman I met in India named Vimal Kumar. And Vimal leads a social justice movement in India for the sweeper people. These are people who are used to be known as the untouchables. Um, I was at a leadership workshop he convened of all their activist leaders from across the country in India. And at the end, you know, these are traditionally very you know, poor communities from a monetary sense. And at the very end, uh, he said, you know, I know many of you have come a long way. Some had come 78 hours by train uh, with no money. And through the kindness of community along the way, found their way there. He said, I know that many of you come a long way with no money and don't know how you're going to get back. He said, so if you need money to get back, you know, uh, let, uh, let me know. And um, what was fascinating to me is people came up one by one and both took money to come home with one hand, but with the other hand, gave money as gratitude for this workshop that he had paid for himself. And as a, from a Western perspective, I'm like, well, wait a minute, why don't you just net those two out? <laughs> like, you're going to take $5 and give two, just, you know. Um, but what I realized was the money here was being used for a sacred purpose, which is to build community and to help support each other and rely on each other in a way that really offended my sense of, you know, accounting, but was uh, very deeply enmeshed in their understanding of the adaptive work and the shared leadership they had to support each other as they move forward. So this is shared humanity, right? And it just happened so naturally because they they saw the need and there was no other way. To learn more about the art of self-reliance, head over to Primal Skills. That's with a Z.com.